Presoptic neurons sure can talk a lot, but exactly what they're actually communicating depends on who's listening on the postsynaptic side. So in this video, we're going to be talking about different types of postsynaptic receptors, what they do, we'll give you some examples of them, as well as what happens when they're targeted by various different toxins and mutations. So the first type of receptor we'll talk about is what's called ionotropic receptor. It's so named because it is a, it an ion channel, just like uh, the leakage channels that we talked about, as well as the voltage-gated channels we talked about. In this particular case, instead of being gated by a depolarization voltage, it's gated by the binding of a neurotransmitter that is uh, bounding to the extracellular side. So these are neurotransmitter-gated ion channels, but otherwise it functions almost exactly like every other ion channel that we've talked about. The conductance changes the function of time depending on the presence of neurotransmitters. And when they open, it directly opens the ion channel that's not directional, ions can flow in and out, and the net effect on the postsynaptic cell depends on the permeability of the channel as well as the driving force as determined by the species of the ion as well as its inertia potential in that particular system. So that's the first one. It gets a little more complicated than that in the next couple of ones. The second type we'll talk about, it's what's called one of the metabotropic receptors. These receptors are, instead of being an ion channel themselves, is kind of like a two-step process. So there is a primary protein that's called a G-protein coupled receptor, or GPCR. We'll talk a little bit about GPCRs in a little bit because they're just really important and you see them all over biology, all over your body. Okay, for now, all you need to know is that it's the G-protein coupled receptor, the GPCR, that actually binds to the neurotransmitter, not the ion channel itself. But once active, the GPCR releases a part of a G protein that activates or deactivates an ion channel. So once again, the effect on the postsynaptic cell depending, uh, depends on the identity of the ions that are able to pass through the channel, as well as the driving force and the nurse potential of that ionic species at that particular time. So here we have a ionotropic receptor that directly opens the ion channel, and the metabotropic ion channel that's opened somewhat indirectly as a, that's an extra step in the process where there's a GPCR that binds to the ligand, the ligand being the neurotransmitter, and then opens up the transmitter. Um, it opens up, up the ion channel that lets some kind of ion flow through. But as long as we have metabotropic receptors, they don't necessarily have to actually even depolarize the cell or do anything of that kind at all. There doesn't have to be an ion channel involved in the depolarization um, on the, on the, on the postsynaptic side. You can also have a G protein coupled effector system that does not directly involve any kind of ion channel. Instead, when the ion channel when the G protein coupled receptor binds to the ligand, binds to the neurotransmitter, it triggers a cascade of biochemical processes that can range from biochemical to protein expression to insertion of proteins to the plasma membrane. Lots and lots of things can happen. This is probably the most flexible of the postsynaptic receptor systems that we're talking about, in part because the varieties of different GPCRs that can bind to neurotransmitters is quite large. And their downstream partners can also go all over the cell and affect change not only at the postsynaptic terminal of this particular synapse, but perhaps neighboring synapses, or even all the way across the cell. Remember, the cell could be quite large, right? So it can travel all the way down to the, to the cell, to the, to the cell, to the cell body, and trigger uh, novel gene expression, for example, from the nucleus. And so. To summarize, we have ionotropic receptors and two different types of metabotropic receptors. So anytime I say ionotropic receptor, you can immediately think that this is an ion channel. And because of an ion channel that's directly bound to the neurotransmitter, the effect is going to be really fast. It's either going to be a depolarization or a hyperpolarization, depending on if it's an excitatory or an inhibitory effect. The metabotropic receptors are all going to be GPCRs. The GPCR can either directly bind to some kind of, directly, directly open the ion channel, or it can do something a little more sophisticated and lasts a bit long time. So unlike the ionotropic receptors, the metabotropic receptors have the, the, the downside that they're slower, but also as a consequence of them being slower, and there's different parts of the protein cascade, they can have very long lasting implications. And this is also a really good way of amplifying the signal so that a small number of neurotransmitters bound at the postsynaptic side to one or two GPCRs could become amplified and become a much, much larger signal that travels all over the cell and has long lasting implications. So in reality, what we have in the nervous system is a variety of all of the above, okay? So we're gonna go through a couple of them now in the next couple of slides. 
first, we're going to look at uh, a couple of key amino acids, um, amino acid neurotransmitters, like we talked about in the previous lecture. We talked about how there's a variety of different neurotransmitters that are really important in the nervous system. And in the central mammalian nervous system, the two key ones are GABA and glutamate. Typically, GABA is inhibitory, and typically, glutamate is excitatory. Now, be careful here. I'm going to say typically inhibitory and typically excitatory because there's nothing inherently excitatory or inhibitory about either GABA or glutamate, right? They're just small molecules that are released by the presynaptic terminal. They're going to drift across the synaptic cleft, and depending on the identity of the neurotrans of the receptor that's on the postsynaptic side, they can either have an inhibitory or an excitatory effect, depending on if you're letting in sodium or chloride or something like that, right? So typically inhibitory and typically excitatory means that in the mammalian central nervous system, the receptors for GABA tend to have an inhibitory effect, causing hypodepolarization, and the receptors for glutamate typically are excitatory, causing depolarization. Okay, so this is a pretty good proxy, but we're going to look at some um, <laughs> we're going to look at some exceptions to this in a little bit as well. Okay, so first let's review. We talked about how there is uh, dendrites that take in inputs. Okay, so now we're kind of at the dendritic uh, the, den the parts of the dendrite that receive inputs that had the uh, impact of, a, of an action potential coming from some other neuron, like the presynaptic one. So this is now we're looking at the postsynaptic side of this neuron. And if you think about it that way, we're going to be going through a set of ionic tropic receptors, and I'm just going to go through a set of them that are really common in the mammalian nervous system, and we're going to look at each of them and what they do. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I told you that GABA and glutamate are really important, so let's start there. These are the glutamate ionotropic receptors. And uh, it's already gotten a little bit complicated because it turns out that there are two main types of inotropic receptors for glutamate that are both found very commonly in the mammalian nervous system. The first one, let's just focus on the first one for now, okay? The first one is called AMPA. And this one is kind of your prototypical, relatively simple glutamate activated channel. So it's an ion channel through which sodium can flow. Remember, this is an ion channel, so when it's open, it does not determine the directionality of the flow. Okay. In other words, it's not even um, stipulating that ions have to flow in, the, that, that sodium has to flow into the cell, causing depolarization. And it's not even actually selective for sodium. <laughs> These, uh, this, this particular channel is, uh, um, is, is open to sodium and potassium. And so the net effect of having one of these glutamate activated amphichannels open is dependent on the membrane voltage at the time, as well as the neurons potential of potassium and sodium in that particular part of the cell. So, but so far so good, right? We have a channel. It is a cation channel, so it's permeable to both sodium and potassium, not to calcium, and it is activated by glutamate. So, so far so good, right? At resting, because the resting potential of the cell is so negative, if you have glutamate come along, bind to the AMPA receptor, it's going to open, and because we are so far away from the nurse potential of sodium, sodium is going to rush into the cell more than potassium is going to come out, which means that we're going to end up depolarizing the cell. So that's what's going to happen with AMPA here. But AMPA is not the only player in the game. There is another set of ionotropic receptors with glutamate that is often found at the same time as AMPA. And these are called NMDA receptors. These NMDA receptors are significantly more complicated. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the various parts of the NMDA receptor and what makes it really cool, OK? One of the things that makes it really cool is that there is a magnesium here that makes it so that these NMDA channels can only open if the cell is already depolarized. I'm going to say that one more time. The NMDA channels is kind of like a coincidence detector. The cell has to be already depolarized and glutamate has to come along in order for it to be activated. So we're already kind of layering in a little more logic here in these receptors, right? So the AMPA is pretty straightforward. If there's glutamate, it opens. With NMDA, it has this additional property that it can only open if the cell is already depolarized. And in addition to being permeable to just sodium and potassium, it is also permeable to calcium. 
Calcium important here because as we talked about in the previous section of the lecture, calcium is present in such low concentrations inside the cell, normally speaking, that it's very commonly used as a signaling molecule. And so the fact that calcium can flow inside the NMDA channel can be used as a downstream signaling device to cause all kinds of things to happen, including the insertion of AMPA receptors into, this, into the cell membrane. So this feedback loop here, which is a really crucial feature of almost all biological systems that I know of, is happening to every single scale description, right? So the NMDA receptor, because of its molecular properties, is a coincidence detector. And when there is a coincidence of the presence of glutamate and a cell that is already depolarized, calcium comes inside the cell. So in addition to causing a depolarization of the postsynaptic terminal, we can also then initiate cascades of other molecular processes that can happen, causing longer acting change. So. The way in which it is detecting the coincidence is by this uh, magnesium binding domain. At the resting potential, there's the magnesium ion that sits there kind of blocking the way, so nothing's getting through. None of the other cations can possibly go through because magnesium is in the pore itself. During depolarization, the magnesium gets kicked out, which makes it possible for the glutamate to then change the conformation of the NFDA channel, making it open to all of the other cation. So, just like the uh, voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated calcium channels, there is a voltage sensitivity here, but the mechanism for how it implements is a, is a little bit different. It, there's a calcium ion that blocks the channel. So those are the AMPA and the NMDA receptors, and even with just those receptors, we haven't even talked about any other type of neurotransmitters yet. Even with just those, we can start to play with it and see how complexity of behavior at this one terminal can occur even if you just had AMPA and NMDA channels. So in this hypothetical scenario, let's walk through the following thought experiment. We have a, uh, we have a postsynaptic gastrointestinal that comes along, just a single one, all right? Calcium comes in, vesicle is released, glutamate is released into the cleft, binds to the AMPA receptor, which causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Because, as we talked about earlier, the nurse potential of sodium makes it so that it's going to flow inside the cell more than potassium is going to leave, causing a net depolarization. And so that's why I'm drawing here. There's a net depolarization, and after a certain time, it dies down according to the solution to the ordinary differential equation that we derive from the Ohm's law. We also call this EPSP for excitatory postsynaptic potential, just for short. It's a bit of terminology. I'll try not to use it too much, but if you ever hear EPSP, that's what it means. It's a small excitatory potential that we measure at the postsynaptic side in response to something like a glutamate binding to an ample receptor. Okay, that's so good. That's scenario one. In the second scenario, what we have is not just one action potential, but a train of action potentials that comes in rapid succession to the presynaptic side. So let's work through what's gonna happen here, right? So at each action potential, calcium is gonna come in and glutamate is gonna come out. Now because they're really coming in rapid succession, AMPA receptors are going to open for every single action potential, but after the first one, this postsynaptic cell is already depolarized, which means that magnesium in the NDA channel is kicked out and the NMDA receptors are now recruited to be responding also to the next action potentials. So, to reiterate, at the first action potential, AMPA channels open, potassium comes in, cell gets a little bit depolarized. Before it gets all the way back down to resting, however, the second action potential comes, AMPA channels open again, but this time the NMDA channels also open, causing more depolarization and so on and so forth. Now we have a runaway process where there's a positive feedback loop where the more these channels open, the more the excitatory postsynaptic potentials get larger and larger and larger. And in this way, the sum of these four presynaptic action potentials is significantly more depolarizing for the postsynaptic cell than just four separate presynaptic action potentials coming along. In other words, this process of having the positive feedback loop between the AMPA receptors and the MD receptors is a way of amplifying that signal so that depending on the relative timing of the presynaptic action potentials, you can get a response that is much larger than the mere sum of its different parts. So that's second scenario, but it gets more fun, okay? So, so far we've only talked about one synapse. Let's add more synapses and see what happens. So, in the third scenario, let's say that there are now two different synapses. We have three cells, 
and we're paying attention to what happens to the postsynaptic cell, which is cell C. And C, cell C is going to be innervated by synapses from A and B. So we're talking about the AC synapse as well as the BC synapse. And our goal is to figure out what happens to C when A fires, okay? So in the beginning, Let's suppose in this hypothetical scenario that the AC synapse only has NMDA receptors and the BC synapse only has ample receptors. So when A fires alone, it fires a single action potential, there is nothing that can happen at the AC synapse because you only have NMDA receptors. NMDA receptors have to be activated by depolarization, and so if there's just one action potential that comes along, nothing happens. Okay, so far so good. Now let's suppose for the next little while, A and B are both firing. Now, I've drawn the geometry of this on purpose here, where these two synapses are in close proximity. I didn't draw them on opposite sides of the dendritic tree. They're actually really close together. So you can see that there's computation by geometry going on. And what happens when A and B both fire repeatedly is that the depolarization from the B synapse allows the AC synapse to also be active because that depolarization is going to spread in the postsynaptic neuron all the way over to the AC synapse. So even though nothing has yet happened in the AC synapse, the depolarization is going to be spreading, according to the cable equations, from the BC synapse, thus activating the NMDA receptors. Now, we have NMDA receptors that are active at the AC synapse, which in addition to triggering depolarization also triggers the influx of calcium. This calcium triggers a bunch of different things, and in my hypothetical scenario, I get to make it up, it's mine. We're going to say that the calcium triggers the insertion of ample receptors at the AC synapse. In other words, I have modified the nature of the AC, of the AC synapse based on the interaction between the AMPA and the NMDA ionotropic glutamate receptors and the physical proximity of these two sets of synapses next to each other. Next, afterwards, even if B is not firing, because I now have ample receptors, ample glutamate receptors at the AC synapse, I can trigger C without B firing by just allowing A to fire. This type of modification in a synapse is a type of synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity being a generic term that means anytime the nature of a synapse, its weight, its associations with other things can be changing. And so we've walked through a, just a, like a simple thought experiment of how the coincidence of A and B firing at the same time can cause this type of synaptic plasticity even if we only had two different receptors at our disposal, the AMPA receptors and the NAD receptors. And what happens here is that you have, have a system where the AC synapse has learned the association between A and B and C in a way that was not really possible before. And if you think about uh, Pavlovian conditioning or different types of simple learning of that kind, it is exactly this type of modification to the synaptic weights that's necessary to associate one thing to another. So here, for example, B is something that is intrinsically associated with C in the Pavlovian context. Maybe that is the, that is the food, right, <laughs> causing salivation. A would be the bell. Initially, A is not associated with C, but because A and B are coming together, there's always a bell and then some food. After a while, there's the association association that's then learned between the bell and, uh, and, uh, and, and the salivation. So that's just an analogy of what's happening here. Obviously, that type of system requires way more synaptic modification than just two cells and two synapses. But I hope what you can see through the simple thought experiment is that this type of modification, because of the way that signals can amplify through this variety of different proteins, can lead to associative learning. The topic of synaptic plasticity is huge and fascinating. We'll be talking more, a lot more about synaptic plasticity in a later video. For now though, let's go back to uh, GABA as the neurotransmitters. We talked a lot about glutamate already, so let's talk about GABA now. GABA, as you remember, is primarily a inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It, uh, it opens, instead of sodium channels, it opens chloride channels. So chloride is uh, usually associated with, with, with sodium, so it's, there's more chloride on the outside of the cell than the inside, okay? When this chloride channels open, chloride rushes into the cell, but because chloride is a negatively charged ion, whereas sodium is a positively charged ion, this influx of chloride has a net inhibitory effect. Other words, rushing of sodium, uh, chloride into the cell causes a hyperpolarization instead of a, a depolarization of the cell. Blockers of the GABA, of GABA receptors, this, this particular type of receptor for GABA is called the GABA-A receptors. They're ionotropic receptors for GABA that are chloride channels. Um, blockers of these GABA-A receptors include picotoxin, and agonists is another word for activators. Activators 
of the GABA-A receptors include barbiturates and benzodiazepines. So keep the logic straight here. You have to think in terms of what agonist means. Agonist means activates. If a barbiturate activates a GABA-A channel, channel, that means that there is more activation of chloride channels, which means that there is more inhibition. So even though it's an agonist, because it's an agonist for a inhibitory channel, the net effect is more inhibition. Barbiturates are named after St. Saint Barbara, uh, who is the, the patron saint of, I think, minors. Uh, they are so named because when they were first synthesized, apparently this was celebrated at the pub on St. Barbara Day, and so that's why they name barbiturates. Glycine is similarly a primarily inhibitory neurotransmitter that's primarily found in the spinal cord as opposed to the, to the brain. Um, just like the GABA-A chloride channels, these glycine channels tend to be chloride channels and they are blocked by strychnine. Fun. Okay, there are more GABA-A agonists that are really cool to think about. This one is called Mucimol. Mucimol is a selective GABA-A agonist, and it causes a variety of different symptoms, including euphoria, out-of-body experiences, and a really cool one called macro, my, Micropsia and Micropsia, which is uh, seeing things as larger or smaller than they are. So, mucimol is found in uh, mushrooms such as this Amanita muscaria mushroom right here. And this is one plausible mechanism through which Alice was able to go to, uh, to Wonderland. And so in this passage of Alice in Wonderland, um, the caterpillar tells Alice to eat the mushroom, right? And he says, one side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. In other words, if there's mucimol inside that mushroom, it could give Alice the symptoms of micropsia and micropsia, feeling like she is actually bigger or smaller than she actually is in reality. Kind of a trip. Okay, there are more ionotropic receptors we're going to march through. We, worked, we talked about ionotropic receptors in the central nervous system. We talked about in the spine. Here we now are in the uh, periphery. Uh, we're talking about innervation of the neuromuscular junction, the synapses between motor neurons and muscles. Um, these are the same synapses that we talked about in the dead frog smashing into a cold block experiment. So the neuromuscular junction, its primary, uh, primary neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And the primary receptor on the muscle side, when it's receiving astromotentials from the motor neurons, is called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And it's so named because nicotine is the primary agonist of this receptor. I'll say it again. It's an agonist of the receptor, which means that nicotine activates the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Its blocker is curare, which, as you can imagine, if you're blocking the action of acetylcholine on your muscles, it means you can't move your muscles anymore. You're paralyzed. Kind of bad, right? And because this is such a quick response synapse, you have two special properties of the neuromuscular junction. One of them is shown in this picture here, where you can see that there's actually a giant set of axons that come down from the same motor neuron that innervates the different muscle fibers. And each of, of these, um, each of these synapses actually has a ton of different terminals that are close together. Because the synaptic vesicle fusion process is stochastic, if you want it to happen for sure, one way of getting that to happen is to just have many, many of them. If the probability of each one happening is small, you multiply that by 100, then the chances of a bunch of them happening at the same time is significantly larger. And that's why we see these giant clusters of, uh, of stains at the axon terminals at the neuromuscular junction. The other thing that's kind of cool about the neuromuscular junction, as I told you about earlier, where in the central nervous system, a lot of the neurotransmitters are uh, taken away by reuptake into the presynaptic cell and they're recycled that way. Now, it turns out for the muscles, that process is just too slow, all right? They needed a more active process because they didn't want that acetylcholine sticking around and continuing to activate those muscle fibers. You needed to go away really, really quickly so I can, so I can do it again in a nice cycle, all right? So the termination of action of the neuromuscular junction is an active enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And this is um, a enzyme, an esterase, that actively breaks down acetylcholine so that they can uh, stop activating the neuromuscular junction, stop activating the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor without waiting for it to be reuptaken by some of the neighboring cells. So I've talked about curare and how devastating it is if you were to be blocking this. So for, uh, for your consideration, let's talk a little bit more about curare. Curare is fatal in the bloodstream because it can get to your muscular, neuromuscular junctions. 
but it happens to be not to be fatal if you ingest it because it actually can't pass through the stomach to blood barrier. If you ingest it, um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't actually inhibit your neuromuscular junctions. Curare in small quantities can also be used as a muscle relaxant during surgery. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a recipe for curare. Um, I, I, can, I can't vouch for this, but I, I've been told that this is a five-star recipe. So if you wanted to make curare, here's what you would do. Step one, you take some leaves from the Strictose toxifera plant. What a name, right? <laughs> Tells you everything you need to know about it. The Strictose toxifera plant. Get yourself some leaves and you simmer it in water for a couple of hours. Next, you add one cup of poison ants and you reduce until it's a viscous paste. Next, we're going to adjust the seasoning by dipping the dart in a paste and seeing how long it takes to kill a small bird. It should take approximately one to two minutes. If it takes too long, then you want to, if it takes too long, you want to concentrate it further. If it takes, if it takes too, if it takes too short, you can dilute it a little bit. Um, and then you can uh, use that to kill small mammals. That's how you make curare. Okay, so we've now talked about the major inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitter systems in the mammalian brain. In reality, it's not just one uh, synapse that's excitatory or one synapse that's inhibitory. Every neuron in your brain is receiving a huge number of synapses at any particular time. I told you before that the estimate is something like each neuron is uh, receiving about 1,000 to 10,000 synapses. Some of these synapses are gonna be excitatory and some of them are going to be inhibitory. By counting them, by looking at them, the best estimate that we have now is approximately 20% of the neurons in the mammalian cortex are inhibitory, which means that 80% of them approximately are excitatory. In other words, there's a huge excess of excitatory neurons in the cell, in the brain, and not nearly as many inhibitory ones. This is a problem. This is a problem because if you are not receiving if you're not receiving enough, uh, if you're not receiving enough inhibition, then you're going to be overwhelmed by excitation. And when one is overwhelmed by excitation, that is what is a seizure. So the brain is having seizures all the time, unless something else is happening. The solution to this problem is what's called the balance of inhibition and excitation, the EI balance, ex excitation and inhibition balance. In individual cells, it turns out there's just a different set of different processes that are tuning the relative weights of the excitatory synapses and the um, inhibitory synapses so they are always roughly balanced at any given time. So even though you're receiving 1,000 inputs, 800 excitatory ones and 200 inhibitory ones, the net effect is actually close to zero. And this balance that is actively maintained is fundamental to regulation of neural activity. Okay, I've talked a lot about excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters, but I wanna be careful here. I'm gonna say this now, I've said it before, we're gonna say it again. There is nothing intrinsically excitatory or inhibitory about any neurotransmitter. It's just the message. How that message is heard depends on a variety of different factors. So. It depends on the identity of the neurotransmitter, obviously. But in addition to the identity of the neurotransmitter, it depends on the specific neurotransmitter receptors that are present on the postsynaptic side and their specific effects, okay? And because a lot of these effects are ion channels opening and ion channels are not selected for directionality, the net effect in terms of are we going to depolarize or hyperpolarize also depends on the nurse potential of the relevant ions, just like we derived in the video lecture about the active and passive properties of neurons. So let's walk through one example of that that I found particularly surprising. So I talked about how in um, in, 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 in GABA, in the mammalian central nervous system is typically an inhibitory neurotransmitter because it tends to cause hypopolarization. And they're chloride channels. This is true, except in immature developing mammalian neurons. There's a lovely story here where in immature mammalian neurons, there is a gene that's active that's called the NKCC1 pump. And that pump is pumping sodium, potassium, and chloride into the cell, tons of it. Which means that in immature mammalian neurons, there is actually a higher concentration of chloride on the inside than the outside, unlike the case in adult cells. In other words, the nurse potential of chloride in this particular configuration is actually positive. So that when GABA, 
binds to the GABA-A receptors and chloride channels open, chloride actually exits the cell. In other words, in this configuration, because of the local concentrations of chloride, GABA can be considered an excitatory neurotransmitter in the immature mammalian neurons. During development, the NKCC1 pump stops being expressed and instead we get what's called the expression of the KCC2 pump, and that's what happens during adulthood. In adulthood, chloride channels, uh, chloride channels opening causes chloride to flow inside the cell and it is hyperpolarizing. And so that's why we want you to be really careful here to think about not only the identity of the neurotransmitters, the nature of the receptors that are listening to the signals, but also pay attention to, especially in the ion pump case, the nurse potential of the ionic species, because when the environment changes, the net effect of the different receptors can very well change as well. And that has important effects for, uh, for development and for the organization of the nervous system during development. Okay, so that was a wild tour of a bunch of different ionotropic receptors. Now we're going to talk about metabotropic receptors. Now, metabotropic receptors are special because they are G protein coupled receptors, GPCRs. So I'm going to say GPCRs quite a bit because it's a it's a it's kind of a short word for that. Um, the details don't particularly matter, but GPCRs are actually one of the coolest things in molecular and cell biology. I remember when I first learned about GPCRs when I was an undergrad. Uh, I took a cell biology class where we had a couple of weeks on GPCRs, and at no point did I realize how important they were. And it was not until I learned what I'm about to tell you that I realized, oh my goodness, GPCRs are everything cool about everything about neurobiology, and that's when I fell in love with GPCRs. So GPCRs are an ancient class of transmembrane proteins that are found in eukaryotic cells. They are membrane receptors and they have seven transmembrane domains. So they have these helices and it crosses the membrane seven times. So seven transmembrane domains. Structurally, that's what they are. Now, there is a huge variety of GPCRs that's active in a variety of different systems. And these proteins are literally the reasons why we have not only synaptic transmission, it is the basis of vision, it is the basis of olfaction, and it is the basis of so much more that we are going to be talking about for the remainder of the course. So learn about GPCRs because this class of proteins are super duper important. Humans have approximately a thousand GPCR genes in our genomes, and each of them bind to very specific ligands and targets and have different downstream effects. And so the class of proteins is responsible for a lot of how your body functions, not only in the brain and the nervous system, but the remainder of the other parts of the system as well. There was an estimate that um, about a third or even a half of pharmaceuticals that are active today that are being used um, medicinally actually target parts of the different, different GPCRs. And we'll see some of them here today as, uh, as targets of various things. So G protein couple receptors. So like, what the heck is that? Why is it called that? So GPCRs are called G protein coupled receptors because they are a receptor, seven transmembrane domains so far so good, that are coupled to what's called a G protein. This is a G protein. G proteins have three domains, alpha, beta, and gamma, okay? And they're called G proteins because they're bound to a GDP or GTP, guanosine diphosphate or guanosine triphosphate. This is a related molecule to ATP and ADP, but instead of adenosine, it's a guanine, okay? So the guanosine diphosphate right here. What happens in REST is that the GPCR is bound to the G protein in its inactive state. When the GPCR received its ligand, and this could also be a light, by the way, this is exactly how vision works. So GPCR could be an opsin, and so in which case, instead of biting to a ligand, it's actually being, being hit by uh, photons. But anyway, <laughs> in the postsynaptic side, generically speaking, we're talking about a ligand, which is a neurotransmitter. So a neurotransmitter binds the GPCR, and once it bounds the GPCR, it's able to release that G protein that's been bound to. The alpha subunit loses its GPT and swaps it out for GTP, and the beta gamma subunits are bound to the membrane, so it's gonna stay bound to the membrane, but it's then free to diffuse away from the GPCR. Both of those sets of molecules are potential signals for downstream effects. You can either have the alpha subunit diffuse away into cytosol and do lots of other things, and you can also use the beta gamma subunit to signal different things downstream as well. So the specifics of exactly what one particular GPCR does depends on what it binds to, as well as what else is present in the system that's listening to the signal from the different G protein activated components um, that's causing its effect later on.
So here are some examples of metabotropic receptors. Remember, metabotropic receptor just means that this receptor is a GPCR. So here is a GPCR that is the beta adrenergic receptor um, whose, um, whose ligand that it's listening to is adrenaline. Adrenaline binds the GPCR and activates adenylocyclase. Adenylocyclase makes cyclic GMP, and cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. The details don't really matter. But what's happening here is after a couple of cascades of proteins, we have phosphorylation of voltage-gated calcium channels in the cardiac muscles. And this makes them more sensitive to depolarization because we have a larger concentration of voltage-gated calcium channels. The net effect of this protein cascade, the signaling cascade, is that heart rate speeds up. And so the force of contraction increases because more calcium enters with each action potential. That's what happens when you have adrenaline and causes your heart rate to speed up and causes your heart to actually increase contractile force as well. So a GPCR pathway is responsible for that whole thing. <clears throat> Another version of the story has to do with the vagal nerve. The vagus nerve, as a, or the vagrant, is a, is a wanderer. So this vagus nerve is, is actually wandering around. It goes all the way from the top of your head. It goes around the aortic arch and comes back up. And it uses the um, neurotransmitter acetylcholine. But instead of using acetylcholine like the neuromuscular junction does, using nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, in the vagus nerve, the same molecule, the same neurotransmitter acetylcholine, is being listened to by metabotropic muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So the two types are acetylcholine, um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are anotropic, they're ion channels. Muscarinic acetylcholine receptors are metabotropic, they're GPCRs. Here's a story about these muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. When acetylcholine receptors, um, when acetylcholine binds to the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, the G protein releases the beta gamma subunit, which then drifts out and activates resting potassium channels in cardi cardiac muscle cells, which makes them less excitable, right? Because by increasing the concentration and the permeability of cardiac cells to potassium, you are making the cells more hypopolarized, closer to the resting nurse potential of potassium, thereby slowing heart rate, okay? So this is one mechanism by which we have two different metabotropic receptors in cardiac muscles responding to either adrenaline or acetylcholine, and they have the net effect of either increasing heart rate or decreasing heart rate. Atropine is also a blocker of the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, atropine is named after Atropos, who is one of the three fates in Greek mythology. In particular, Atropos is the sister that's responsible for cutting the string, ending life. So atropine <laughs> uh, comes from the, the plant Atropa belladonna, and it is a deadly nightshade. Um, so belladonna means beautiful women, and it's so named because people, uh, women in Greece used to use belladonna to, to, to rub it in their eyes as a cosmetic because it caused pupil dilation, and pupil dilation was considered to be beautiful at the time. So that's atropine. In large concentrations, it's extraordinarily poisonous because ingesting it makes your heart stop. <laughs> So you kind of need that. In small doses, you can use atropine to treat bradycardia. Um, and it's because atropine, once again, is a blocker of the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. The muscarinic acetylcholine receptor slows the heart, and when you block it, then, um, then, 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 then it's not a, it's not, it's, it, the, the whole thing kind of stops, and that's not very good. Okay, so this is the whirlwind tour of some of the interesting neurotransmitters and the receptor systems. But your nervous system uses a lot of different neurotransmitters, some of which we haven't even mentioned yet, and we will in the following lectures. And there's even more different types of receptors that we have not even mentioned. So uh, as, a, as a, just a preview, this is like a very non-exhaustive list. Here are some neurotransmitter receptors that are encoded by the human genome. We see here on the left-hand side the neurotransmitters. A lot of them have both ionotropic receptors as well as metabolic receptors. They have different types of ionotropic receptors like glutamate does. And even among the AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors for glutamate, there's multiple genes coding for them that can be differentially regulated depending on what the specific consequences and contexts of those cells are for expressing each of these different types of neurotransmitters. So it's by differentially regulating the localization quantity and identity of these neurotransmitter receptor systems that we can very finely tune the regulation of the nervous system. Okay, so in summary, we talked about different types of postsynaptic receptors. The key concepts here are that receptors of neurotransmitters can either be ionotropic or metabotropic. 
Ionotropic receptors are ligand-gated ion channels, and so they act very quickly. In contrast, metabotropic receptors are ligand-gated GPCRs, G-protein-coupled receptors, and they're either coupled to ion channels or lots of other things. They are more slow, they're not as fast as ionotropic receptors, but they can lead to much longer-lasting effects. There's a huge variety of different receptors and different common neurotransmitters and even uncommon neurotransmitters, and they're really cool to think about. And there's nothing intrinsically inhibitory or excitatory about any neurotransmitter. And the overall function of a synapse requires us to pay attention to what the neurotransmitter is, which are the receptor systems that are listening to those signals, and the equilibrium potential of the relevant ions. So, those are different types of postsynaptic receptors. If you keep them straight and keep this terminology straight, you can actually understand a really huge variety of fundamental neurobiology at the cellular and molecular levels by cataloging the different types of effector systems that may or may not be active in different parts of your nervous system.